This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, visitors and church family. It feels great to be with you. Did you know the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you right now? That's real. Wow. You are so loved. We're so glad to be worshiping with you this morning. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in the strong name of Jesus. There's so many challenges that we're facing in our country. We pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit to bring a sense of peace and change. Lord, we love you and we look to you as always. We pray, Father, that today you'd help us to be more and more like you. Help us never to fall into despair, but fill our hearts with the hope that is founded in your word. Help us to love our neighbor and love you with all our heart. And we ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Who can bend my burdens and make them beautiful? Who can bring the healing to the heart I hold? Who else could part the waters when I need it?
In preparation for the message, Revelation 22, 1 through 7 and 17. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in the scroll. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. Amen. Can't win. 
Hi friends, we are so happy you've joined us in worship today. You are the beloved of God and we are truly thankful that you've chosen to be a part of this church family. Hannah and I want you to know that the Lord invites people to build a foundation by bringing love and compassion into the 15 feet of space around them. In fact, I've stated in past sermons that it's not your job to love the world, it's the Lord's job. Our job is to love our neighbors, everyone who is near us, even our enemies. Matthew 22, 37 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring someone into your mind and then go out of your way to intentionally love that person. Allow Jesus to work in you to enable you to love them just as they are, not as you want them to be. Let Jesus shine His healing glory to others through you. This is precisely what happens when you uphold the hour of power with your generosity. As you're transformed by the love of Christ and pay it forward to others through your giving, your support heals and restores millions around the world. You're an integral part in helping to enable others to experience the very heart of God. Because we are so thankful for your ongoing support, our team has created a very special thank you offer for you this month. Call, write, or go online to request the Love Grows Here garden flag. For your gift of just $25 or more, this charming garden flag and stake will add a whimsical touch to your garden or planter. Accompanied by a sturdy, decorative iron stake, this garden flag is perfectly suited for any deck, patio, or veranda, and can be used indoors or outdoors. Call, write, or go online and request the Love Grows Here garden flag for your gift of $25 or more. The healing love of God opens hearts to reach their full potential and enables us to shine and grow in His glory. This is the power of the gospel, and it's why we need your help to continue sending Hour of Power around the world. Thank you so, so much for your love and support. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. James Barnett is an author and the president of Dayspring a Christian company that sells products to make Jesus known through social expression. His new book is called Blue Skies, How to Live in the Extraordinary Expectation of What's Around the Corner. His book takes a look at how his family's travels through America's national parks gave him new perspective on success, callings, and joy. Please welcome James Barnett. James, hi, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, for those who are not familiar, tell us a little bit about your story. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here, Bobby, and, and just uh, thrilled to be here and be a part of, of today. But uh, I'm the youngest of seven. I grew up in uh, Northwest Arkansas and, and uh, you know, really was in a hurry to grow up. And I, I was, you know, trying to hurry up and get ahead and get my journey going and, and went to school and got married, got a job and, and uh, been part of Dayspring here this last 40 years. God has just done amazing things as we continue to do ministry and business here. Oh, great. And uh, you have this book, we wanted to talk to you about it, called Blue Skies. I'm really into the subject that you're bringing about. I, you, it's not a super common topic in Christianity, but the, the value of being outdoors, I think of you as almost like a, was it St. Francis of Assisi that was always outside with the animals and things like this. You really um, have this push to encourage people to take advantage of things like state parks. Um, is that what your book's about? Tell us a, a little bit about it. <clears throat> well, really my, my book is, is really about uh, the purpose of really seeing God, you know, through everything we do. Yeah. You know, God is always working. He's always there. And we just have to be paying attention. And getting outdoors and, and seeing what God is doing gives us that opportunity. And, and when I was uh, in my 30s, I began to take national park trips with my family. We went to over 44 national parks. And we would do the hikes and, and see the places and it was at that time over that season that i began to look again to see god just through every aspect of nature and god is always doing something new and no national park is the same 
there are so many uh, things that we can see that when we see God at work, and, it, and that's really my book is really about even though that, that we have clouds and, and challenges in life, there's always blue skies. God is always at work, and we have to see and, and we have to be looking for where he's working. Uh, these beautiful places really do something, and just the, the world, the, the universe at large, when you really look at it, especially outside of cities, it has a way of witnessing to the Lord in a strange way. Like I, my brother had this good friend who was a diehard atheist, and I'm sure he had heard all sorts of arguments for God and everything, you know, and none of them, you know, convinced him, and that's fine. But then he went to my brother, with my brother to Yosemite, and then afterwards he said, maybe, maybe there's a God. And it's funny how like just visiting, <clears throat> just seeing it and believing it, something like that can soften someone's heart to get a little bit bigger picture of the universe. Well, it really can. And, and that, that, and when you see, and, you, and by the way, Yosemite is one of my favorite parks. People ask me many times, what's your favorite? And I said, well, there's about five that are my favorites, but Yosemite is right up there. There's not a more beautiful view when you come through the tunnel and you pull over to the left and you see the view uh, of Yosemite. But, you know, well, I think- Pause right there. The key... I gotta know, I gotta know, what are the five? Okay. <laughs> oh, what are the five? Well, you've gotta get Ye Yellowstone in there, the Tetons are there, Glacier is there, Mount Rainier, when you're at sea level and you're looking at Mount Rainier at a 14,000 foot mountain from the ocean, it is just amazing. So those will be right up there. And then I'd have to put Zion in there also and, and uh, the hikes there, at at uh, Angel's Landing and, and the Narrows, those are just magnificent. That's great. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are like, uh, the Grand Canyon just entered the chat. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yes, the Grand Canyon. Yeah, that's right. It's hard to find five. Grand Canyon will be there too. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, amazing. No, I'm just, <laughs> just having fun. You. One of the things you talk about in your book uh, is this difference between being driven and called. I really love this perspective. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm the youngest of seven and I was, was in a hurry to grow up. My dad was a, a pastor of small churches and a school teacher. And I always you know, had a heart for the Lord, but I, was, I loved business and I loved uh, achievement and I was competitive. And, and so I was in a hurry to, to not only grow up, but to get married and have kids and get my job and, and get a house and you know, we get what we called the American dream. And, and you know, in the early thirties, I'd achieved that and I was really, searching, Lord, is this it? You know, and I, and I was praying and asking the Lord and I went to a conference uh, with about uh, a group of about 400 people and the, the theme of that conference was, are you driven or are you called? Hmm. And you know, I just did not really understand this calling thing and I, was, I had to leave that conference and say I was really driven, I was driven to achieve and I didn't know really why and I began to ask the Lord, what are you, what are you saying, Lord? And, and you know, most, most of my prayer life was really about me. I would say, God, could you help bless me? Could you help do this for me? And when he did, I would be excited. When he didn't, I would be disappointed. And I would say, why God, why? But I discovered I was asking the wrong questions. And the real question is what? What are you up to, God? Mm. And the, the focus is on what he is about. And so I began to look at this calling thing about it's really the calling is really, what is God doing? And am I joining him? And at, you know, he's always working. And that call of God is, we've got to look again to see that call of God, to see it at work. You know, that scripture in Romans 8, all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. It's not my purpose, it's his purpose. So really understanding that in these, these national park trips, as I began to look again and see God at work and see God's beauty and God's majesty, I began to look at life differently. And I wanted to pass that on to this next generation. How do we do that? How do we look again and see God at work, even among, amongst the clouds, uh, among, the ch among the challenges that we face? God is always working. There's always blue skies, but we've got to be looking for them. Well, if you are at home and you're looking for, if you love the outdoors, or maybe you just feel stuck you know, in a job and you need some encouragement to get out and see what God's created and have your faith encouraged, I want to encourage you to get Blue Skies, How to Live in Extraordinary Expectation, Expectation of What's Around the Corner by James Barnett. James, thank you so much. We appreciate you. And thanks for writing this great book. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. God bless.
Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with my neighbor. I think about uh, all the terrible things that are going on around the world. It's hard, isn't it? Not just in our country. Uh, welcome to our visitors from Syria. Of course, it's been a very tough time in, in that country. Tough time in Ukraine. Europe is on edge and challenges that so many people face. Let me just say that we thank the Lord that we know how the story ends. That in a way, you read a book and there are these challenging seasons you go through and you think, is there any resolution to this thing? And the good news is that the further along we get in the story, uh, even if it seems like it's getting worse, just like when you read any novel, you can go to the last page and see that Frodo dropped the ring in the fire or that, or whatever, I'm not gonna do those books, but you know what I mean. And I, I wanna begin with the end in my message today. You know, the Bible is not a book. Everybody say, the Bible's not a book. It's a library. It's a library. And each book it's, gives us a different part of the whole story. The, the Bible begins and ends, though, with a theme. And the theme is a garden. Uh, you always think of it as being a warm place, a beautiful place, and a perfect place. It begins with uh, a place of safety, deep connectedness, the symbol of nakedness, is, is living without shame, the way that little kids love to run around naked. You know, they don't know, they don't care that there's this no shame, there's no fear of life. And it begins with that garden, and then it ends with the garden and it begins with this tree it ends with this tree and this the tree of life that brings healing to the nations and so we turn to the I got an award not a real award I got a pretend award from our staff because in the 50 years of our power I was the first preacher to ever preach on revelation so now I try and do it once a year well my my passage this week will be from the very last chapter of the library of the Bible the last book of the last the last chapter of the last book of Revelation, and it paints the picture of a garden and of living water and of a tree that gives healing to the nations. I'll read it to you. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God of the Lamb will be in the city, and the servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will not be need, the light of the lamp, or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servant the things that must soon take place. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Reading that, it reminds me of reading Lord of the Rings, which is something I do often. 
I enjoy uh, Lord of the Rings because it, I don't know, it, it takes me to another world. It helps me sleep at night, actually, and it, it, it carries me to a better place somehow, and it helps me think of life in a sort of a grander, big vision, and it reminds, this reminds me of reading that somehow. Like, it's hard to put a finger on it, but it gives my heart hope and nourishment in some strange way. Recently, uh, or recently, just a few days ago, Hannah and I returned from a very short trip to Florida for a family reunion. Uh, every year, her family throws this, and she has a big family. Her parents have six children, five boys, and one girl. So I got the only girl. I'm a lucky guy. I always thought I would get married around 30, but then I met Hannah, so I got married at 21. <laughs> and all those kids are married, and they all have kids, so this is a big family reunion. And when I met Hannah, her father wasn't wealthy, but since then he's become a pretty wealthy man, which is lucky for me, because that means I get a free vacation, you know, every summer. <laughs> so that's cool. And one of the things we do is we gather in this big room uh, where they're staying, where they rent this house. And every morning we begin with a very long time of devotional sharing where everybody sort of talks and shares and we pray for one another and, and, we, and everybody takes turns. Well, the last day was uh, Hannah's mom's turn. And she had this great revelation. First of all, picture it, you know. Uh, an, a couple in their 60s that's served God a lot of their life and they've been blessed financially and they have their family all around them and they all love the Lord. And all these kids and cinnamon rolls and coffee and all the good stuff, you know. And uh, her mother, looking sort of at her posterity, you know, says sort of this thing that she'd been waiting to share all week. She was kind of excited. And it's a great revelation. She said, in life... I've learned, you know, that sometimes as Christians we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but other times we eat from the tree of life. And she told everybody that was there, eat of the tree of life. Eat of the Spirit of God. Let the Spirit of God nourish your heart and your soul. I knew instantly what she meant. I went to seminary and I loved it and it was a good thing for me. But sometimes they call seminary cemetery <laughs> because there, there's a certain, it's easy to fall into the trap of over intellectualization or philosophical debate where in your mind you've got this thing for God but you're not nourished by the Spirit of God when you wake in the morning. Where when you wake up you look to the sky and you th say thank you Lord for another breath and another day and for your Holy Spirit. And thank you for Christ crucified that I can come before your throne boldly as a child of God, completely righteous and justified before you. Called and beloved, your own. And to be nourished daily by the tree of life. And she said there's a danger when you're nourished by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and not by the tree of life. And then she said something else that I don't think was planned, but I thought was perfect. Looking around at all of her kids and grandkids, she said, you know, the older I get, the younger I feel. I knew what she meant by that. The older I get, the younger I feel. You know, in the world here in Orange County, there's so much wealth. When I go to the gym, I see Lamborghinis and Ferraris and Range Rovers, and there's nothing wrong with that. But everybody, most of the people in that gym don't say the older I get, the younger I feel. They say the older I get, the older I feel. And there's something that the world offers right now, but over time gives you diminished returns. But when you're in the kingdom of God and you know the Lord and he lives in your heart, your body may age like milk, but your spirit ages like wine. You get something sweeter on the inside of you the older you get. And to be frank, you become more pleasant to be around. And you even have more to offer a hurting world that is only nourished by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and not by the tree of life. And so she encouraged us, eat of the Spirit. Be nourished by the tree of life and by what the Spirit has to offer. You know, for believers, the end is always getting better. In the kingdom, you know, everybody will face death. Whether it's today or 100 years from now, we'll all face the same end. 
But for believers, that ending in some ways is, is sad, but it's also sweet. That maybe you'll see your parents and grandparents again. That you'll eat of the tree of life for real. That you'll, it'll be more like waking up than falling asleep. But the world doesn't offer that. And there's a sense in the world's message to get it now, you only live once. Don't, don't get to your life, the end of your life, regretting that you didn't sleep around a little more or make a little more money or travel more or collect more seashells. But I also think that there will be another kind of regret even for Christians that we get to the end and we say, woe to me that I spent so much time focusing on those things. The only thing we take with us to heaven is the choices we made. My friend, begin with the end in mind today and know that it's never too late to finish well. Anyone who wants to finish life well, I believe, will live life well. That's what I believe. And I think that's a Christian way to view the world. For many people, death is a scary thing. The end is a scary thing. For you, it doesn't need to be that way. You build your life with the end in mind, and you'll go to the grave singing a song with the gospel in your heart and home with the doors wide open for you. So begin with the end in mind. Uh, it is so important, first of all, that as believers we understand the power of delayed gratification. Uh, you might remember this famous study in the 1970s done by Stanford. You've probably heard it a million times, but it's a powerful study. It was on delayed discounting, which is a science, scientific way of saying delayed gratification. And in this study, they offered children the opportunity to eat one marshmallow now, or, and they would leave the room and come back 15 minutes later, you can have two marshmallows later. And some of the kids just ate the marshmallow right away. Some of the kids waited. You see them on video, all tortured. And what they found out was that the kids that waited and ate two marshmallows they followed them, you know, for the next like 30, 40 years. And they found that the kids who waited to eat the two marshmallows did better in every aspect of life. They did better financially in their careers. They did better relationally. They had more friends. They were more successful financially in almost, and even measurements which are subjective, but trying to get data of who's happier overwhelmingly D delayed gratification was a huge indicator and was the only indicator in this case of, of the difference between the two. And there have been multiple studies on the power of delayed gratification. In fact, there was just one an income study that was done in 2018 that they said they believe delayed gratification, the ability to delay gratification was the number one indicator of your income, more than education or anything else. So it's interesting to see that there's this character trait that I felt I was sort of taught when I was a kid, you know, that this, this idea that good things come to those who wait. Haven and I do this rap every morning on our way to school to get us ready. And someday I'll do it with her here, Britta goes, we're going to be, and then she goes, positive. And then I say, because knowledge is, and she goes, power. And I say, leaders are, she says, readers. And I say, if you can dream it, she goes, you can do it. And then if I, I say, if it's great, she goes, it's worth the wait. And then we both go, honor Jesus with your life. And then we play like, it's, anyway, it's a long story. It's a cool thing we do. You have to be there. You have to be there to experience it. But I'm trying to train her that if it's great, it's worth the wait. But our world has become so desperate for meaning that we just need something now to survive another day. Amen. That is not what God has in store for you. I do not know, for example, the effects of rampant pornography and especially Tinder. There's a little bit Bobby getting pious now. 
But I feel like in 20 years, therapists are going to say that this is one of the most destructive things that ever happened. If you don't know, Tinder is like a, just you go on the phone and you find someone to have sex with. I also find that in our culture today, we just love billionaires so much. Like the, the, it seems like very often we're always talking about billionaires and we secretly want to be billionaires, but we resent them because we're not billionaires, but lessons we can learn from billionaires to become billionaires. You probably can name everybody on this picture, or most of them, including Lex Luthor in the middle there. And then we have this sense of the ideal would be non-work. You know, there's nothing wrong with billionaires, obviously. I'm sure they've done some good things, etc. But this feeling of like, if I could just have fun all the time and never work and like do all this stuff, and then there's this fast, hurried sense that many of us have. We're all kind of like Veruca Salt from Willy Wonka. You remember Veruca Salt? I want the world. I want the whole world. I want to lock it right up in my pocket. It's my bar of chocolate. Give it to me now. I want today. I want tomorrow. I'm wondering just how many people are like, dude, stop, you're losing us. I want. This is funny. But there is this nowness. I want it now. I want everything now, all at the same time, right now. Can we just say that's killing us? Can we just say that's crushing our soul and our spirit? That there is something relieving and fun and awesome sometimes about getting it now. But can I just tell you what we all know? You get diminished returns on that. And it's a little less cool the next time, every time, over and over. What if there's something that was opposite of diminished returns? And this is what I'm getting at is that, what, you know, when I think of when I think of sex, for example, and I don't mean to be get off my lawn Bobby today, you know what I mean? I'm not like trying to be judgmental of everybody, but when I think of sex and relationships, I like this is what everybody really wants. A couple that has been together for a long time, that grows old together and has shared memories and a life that was well lived with each other. This is what you really want. This is what everybody really needs. You know, Hannah and I were virgins when we got married at 21. And it's not to shame anybody, but I feel like if that happened today, all my friends would make, make fun of me for, for being a virgin in my 20s. There's someone that I've, a life that I'm building with another person that as I grow old, I grow old with her. And, in, you know, as a kid, I was taught to store up for myself treasures in heaven. Think that there are things you can get for yourself in this life that no one can take from you. Like wisdom or an education or blessing or favor. And I think about how good, meaningful work is a good thing for a person to have. That non-work is not the ideal. All that to simply say that I think that, that the Lord offers us something better than the rushed, instant gratification of this world. He offers us the ability to lead a truly meaningful life that simply believes in that old-fashioned idea, I'm going to leave this place better than I left it. That I want to believe that the world was a little better because I lived in it. And as believers, we would say that we were given a way to do that and do it well. To do what's good, not because someone sees me, but just because I love what is good and I hate what is evil. And that's who I want to be. The heroes, when I was a kid that I heard all the time, I wouldn't have been able, at, at even 15, to name one billionaire for you. But I knew who Mother Teresa was, and I knew who Fred, Frederick Douglass was, and I knew who Nelson Mandela was, and I knew who Oscar Schindler was. And I knew who Neil Diamond was. <laughs> you know, anyway. There's a, an amazing story about a man who, during a, just before the Second World War, just as it was starting, 
a man named Nicholas Winton. You might be familiar with the name. Nobody had ever heard of him until 1988. This man, uh, 50 years before, as the Holocaust was beginning, was smuggling Jewish children out of Czechoslovakia. He smuggled out 669 children over a very short period, found all of them homes and families that they were adopted into, and they believe that nearly all of those kids would have been killed if he hadn't done that. Nobody had heard about it until one day somebody found in an attic a dusty uh, like brochure, not brochure, dusty log of the names of these children and where they went and what their, what their birthdays were, etc and realized that this was a log of all of the kids he had saved. And so the BBC looked into this and gathered some of those children 50 years later who were now adults and got them together and wanted to introduce them to Nicholas Winton who until this point nobody had ever heard of. Check this out. All the letters. But back here is the list of all the children this is Vera Diamant, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. Hello. <laughs> and it was just so wonderful, so terribly, terribly touching. Is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? If so, could you stand up, please? I love that story, you know. You know, the thing I love most about that story, I obviously saved a bunch of kids, but even more powerful is that he didn't tell anybody. His whole life, he was gonna go to the grave and even the kids wouldn't have known who was that guy from England that saved me. Yeah, the, the, to me, this is the epitome of a really good person. How many people today want to be good so that people will think of them as good? Rather than, I just love what is good and what is right. And I believe that this moment that was had here, I think that there will be things in life and people that you'll help and nobody will ever say thank you to you for, it, ever. You might have even forgotten. It's been so long since you helped that person. But I believe that when you get to the end, there's going to be a time when maybe you'll have a moment like that too, where someone will say, thank you for that one day that you helped me. We never know. And so today's sermon, because I'm just beginning, is, just kidding, <laughs> as I finish, as I rev up. Today's sermon is actually called Get Your Garden On because I believe that in life, we're always, our life is a garden. Jesus just tells us this plainly, that in life, we're always broadcasting seeds around us that in their season will bear fruit. You might have had an old crotchety aunt that back in the day when you did something wrong, she looked at you and said, you reap what you sow. I didn't have one of those, but I've been around judgmental people. Of course, this just means she doesn't like you. But, but what she means by that is, see, that's what you get for all your ill-gotten, whatever, okay. 
So when we think of you reap what you sow, we think of it as in a negative way, but in Gala and it's in the Bible in Galatians, but there's a positive aspect to that too, that, that when you sow, when you do, when you put seeds in the ground and nobody sees it, you know that's building up for you a harvest, a real harvest, that when you do the things and nobody sees it, but you plant these seeds in life, you're building up for yourself a, gr a garden, a life that gets better over time. You don't experience it now, but it will get better. It's amazing to me. I just started gardening with my kids and I'm terrible at it, which is kind of a Schuler thing. Schulers are always bad at gardening. We're more like fishermen. Even my grandpa got into preaching because he was such a bad farmer. And um, Grandpa Schuler. And uh, I have a brown thumb, you know, everything I touch turns brown and dies. But if I get seedlings, I do okay. Everything, you know, but it's amazing to me, you take this tiny little seed, you know, put it in the ground, and it turns into this humongous thing of spinach, or jalapenos, or an uh, apple tree, or strawberries. And these are all things I'm trying to grow right now, but I'm failing it. But it's possible. All things are possible. And so in life, you just, there's so much power in a hidden seed, a seed that is, that is buried. And in your life, every day you are planting good seeds and bad seeds. Every day, you're doing things that are creating the garden of your life. Words are seeds. When you speak blessing over someone who's broken or messed up or having a rough day, you are planting something in their soul that will grow and change their life. Amen. And it is faith that keeps that seed in the ground. Faith that this person can become a new creation. And when you speak the word, or when you listen to a sermon, or when you study the scripture, or something that encourages you, you hold those words within you, and it is faith that keeps those seeds in the ground. And when you give money, even secretly, to someone in need, or to something you care about, it is faith that keeps that seed in the ground. And when you spend your time that to so many other people seems like a waste of time, but you spend it with people that need it, like little kids, or being a care worker, or blessing your neighbor, or helping someone that you know they'll never change. You are planting seeds of change in the garden of your life. And the scripture tells us that those seeds will have 30, 60, and 100 fold. It's not about planting the seeds, it's about keeping them in the ground. And it is faith. That keeps them there. And it's a lot of work, isn't it? You know, I heard once that people don't want to do the hard work. But can I tell you that a, a garden full of weeds is a lot harder work than a garden full of tomatoes? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of bugs. It's a lot of pollen and dust. It might be hard work planting good seed, but it's harder work tending to a garden full of weeds. And many of us are planting those seeds every day. We're just carelessly spewing negative words, words of fear. We're deceiving people, and it's our fear that keeps those seeds in the ground. Sometimes we curse people with contempt, or we call some group of people or some job, or some anything. We call them snakes, or cockroaches, or rats, or pigs, or goblins. Those are seeds you're planting in the garden of your life. And let me tell you, you do not want to reap of that harvest. And it is fear that keeps it in the ground. And some of us have had maybe parents or, or a teacher that said things over you that in your head you know it's not true, but you hold on to those seeds. Seeds of contempt towards you, that you're worthless, that you're a sinner, that you're messed up, that you're a horrible person. And it is fear that keeps those seeds in the ground. You're none of those things. That's a lie. The enemy, he's, he just loves to lie to people. The, the, the kingdom of darkness is just built on deception. It's its foundation. The whole kingdom of darkness is just built on lies about you. And the unforgiveness and the resentment that we feel towards people, those are seeds in the ground and faith, fear keeps them there. And they'll keep growing unless you yank those things out of the ground. Yank them out of the ground every day. Tend to your garden. 
Your life is a garden. Your life is a garden. You choose every day what you're going to grow. Every day you choose. So choose today to build the kind of garden that will flourish where time is on your side. And you'll be very, very grateful you did. Lord Jesus, we ask you to help us with this and to help us to tend to our garden with faith. We just come to you and we say, show us how to live the rich, full kind of life that's made available when we love you with all our heart and all our soul and love our neighbor as ourself. Help us this morning to know what it really means to drink of the water of life and to eat of the tree of life. We ask it all in the very strong name of Jesus. Amen. Hi friend, have you subscribed to our channel yet? If not, then I hope you will. Our Power is filled with uplifting content to nourish your spirit and help you grow closer to Jesus. We've created this channel to remind you that no matter who you are or what you've done, God loves you and so do we.